Before getting into this video, we would like to address an error made in our previous video. We have been made aware by some of our amazing viewers that we were incorrect in our statement about the stamp to trigger guards being a strictly post-war piece of your rifle. In fact, these trigger guards started being issued in the later stages of the war. Though they are not nearly as common as the milled trigger guards, they were most definitely present. A very special thank you to those who made us aware of this information and help us be as informative as possible to help make your impressions the best they can be. Now, on with the video. In the US military, there were countless divisions, and within those divisions, people had different responsibilities. To identify these divisions and where your responsibilities resided, you would wear patches to identify your unit in rank, or your insignia. Today's topic will focus strictly on the basic enlisted aspect of patches in the field, as there is much more to insignia that can be covered at a later time. Starting on the topic of divisional insignia, GIs would wear patches on their left shoulder to identify the division they were currently a part of. The patch would be put on a half to one inch away from the seam of your shoulder. During the war, there were 91 army divisions active, so your options are pretty open. Keep in mind that GIs were not always seen with divisional insignia. This is a major factor in which division you choose to portray, as the frequency of insignia on uniforms varies. Below your unit insignia is placed your rank. This insignia is applied to both sides of your arm. For those starting out in the hobby, you will almost always begin as a buck private, which means you will have no rank insignia to apply. From here, you can be promoted to PFC and the NCO ranks. The enlisted rank for World War II goes as follows. Private, Private First Class, Corporal, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, Technical Sergeant, First Sergeant, and Master Sergeant. And in 1943, the inclusion of the technician grades. Privates and PFCs are at the bottom of the totem pole. They have the least amount of responsibilities in terms of unit management and are directed by all other ranks above them. The rank of corporal is the base of the non-commissioned officer structure. At the squad level, they were responsible for the appearance, cleanliness, and other personal training of the men below them. Corporals were often seen as the assistant squad leader, or ASL, early in the war, followed by the sergeant. Sergeants were a step up from corporals in their leadership and responsibilities operating on the squad basis. Early in the war, sergeants were often seen in the squad leader role. As a squad leader, you were in charge of the care and organization of your squad. Sergeants would be seen in the role of squad leader until they were reorganized in 1944 to the position of assistant squad leader. Staff sergeants could operate on both platoon and squad level, being designated as the squad leader rank in 1944, as well as the platoon guide, who was in charge of supplying his platoon with food and ammunition. Before this, staff sergeants were typically in the role of platoon sergeant, overseeing the organization, care, and discipline of the men on the platoon level. Once the ranks were adjusted in 1944, the role of platoon sergeant was assigned to the rank of technical sergeant. Before this, technical sergeants were primarily in staff roles at the battalion level. After technical sergeants came the first sergeant. First sergeants oversaw these responsibilities on the company level. These were typically the highest NCO rank you could have seen on the front lines, with the final rank of master sergeant typically having responsibilities that were on the regimental level. After these ranks comes the technician grades. The technician grades were specialist roles like aid men, vehicle drivers, radio operators, and clerks. These could be identified by their chevrons, which had a T underneath them. The chevrons would tell you what their pay grade was equivalent to, and were often referred to as corporals or sergeants. However, they do not hold the same authority and responsibility as their non-specialist counterparts. Technician grades were merely in charge of their own job and not of the jobs of those around them. There were four primary types of these patches. You had rayon, wool on wool, embroidered wool, and khaki. These were supposedly intended to go with certain issued uniforms. However, you see examples of all of them being used with a wide variety of field and dress uniforms. After the war, the design of patches went through a few changes in sizes, colors, and materials. These are some examples of post-war patches that you should not use with a World War II impression. After World War II, around 1948, there was a massive change in the NCO structure, 
with the technician ranks being combined into the specialist rank in 1955, and a number of new sergeant ranks being added later on. In addition to patches, another identifying mark of an NCO was a horizontal stripe on the back of the helmet. These can be seen either painted on or even applied on with tape. If you choose to use tape for your impression, we recommend white gaffer's tape for your helmet. These stripes were most common in the European and Mediterranean theater of operations, with this practice not really being seen on helmets stateside or in the Pacific theater. For sewing on the patch itself, you can certainly pay the local dry cleaner to do the job for you. However, the price hikes up relatively quickly, as it can typically cost $15 per patch. Learning to do it for yourself will enable you to save loads of money, especially if doing impressions of different ranks and divisions. When it comes to putting on these patches, there is a certain way for it to be done. Your unit insignia, as discussed earlier, should be about one finger's width away from the seam and centered on your shoulder. For shirts, using the seam that runs across the top of your shoulder is a good reference for your center point. For your field jackets, the epaulette can work as a great reference to ensure that your patch is centered. Your chevrons are to be towards the middle of your shoulder and elbow. Make sure that the point of your chevron lines up to the bottom of your patch. A good reference for your patch's position is to place it about a dollar bill's length from your shoulder seam. When stitching your patches, be sure to use clothespins to ensure that the patch stays in place when stitching. When sewing, you can choose to do something simple or something with a little more flair. Typically, black, white, tan, or OD thread is what would have been seen on uniforms. It must be stressed to not use things like stitch witchery, as iron-ons will do irreversible damage to your uniforms, and you'll have to buy a whole new shirt or jacket. Actual stitching is reversible. Stitch witchery isn't. Keep in mind the patches are not mandatory for the impression. There's plenty of evidence of soldiers of all ranks not wearing identifying insignia while in theater. This can all depend on two large factors, which units you are portraying and during what time frame. These can be major factors in whether or not you would have seen a lot of identifying insignia. In terms of buying this insignia, original patches are incredibly easy to come across for affordable prices. They show up very regularly on eBay, as well as in surplus stores and reenactment vendors for fairly good prices. However, if you are not comfortable with the idea of using original patches, At The Front sells reproductions in wool, rayon, and khaki material, as well as a wide assortment of Army Divisional patches. The representation of rank and division could be seen throughout the entire war and beyond. The rank system of World War II were the key stepping stones to the ranks of our modern military. Unfortunately, we were unable to go further in depth on the rank system for the U.S. Army in World War II, as there is much more to these ranks than just the frontline roles. For a more detailed video, we recommend the YouTube video, U.S. Army Rank Insignia of World War II, by the channel Battle Order. A link for the video will be in the description. With that being said, we hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to stay tuned for future episodes. And remember, if you're in the army now, you're not behind the plow. You'll never get rich by digging a ditch. You're in the army now. You're in the army now. You're in the army now. You'll never get rich on the salary which you get in the army now.